The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. In our readings this morning, we have two explorations of hospitality. You may have caught that as you were listening, but it's possible that you didn't. The first reading is Abraham and Sarah, and they have a visitor that comes. The visitor isn't seen by Sarah, at least until the end, but Abram sees the visitor coming, or visitors as they come, and gives us a very clear model of what hospitality looks like. He runs to them, he greets them, he bows down before them, and then he invites them to come and sit and go get, uh, and then he goes to get a meal. So it's a very clear sense of what it means to be hospitable. And it's the one most of us think of. It's the physical, material way of showing people welcome. It's not so easy to do right now during a time in which we are basically quarantining ourselves from one another. We aren't having people into our homes. Generally, we're not making really nice meals for them. But what about these texts? Teach us something about hospitality that we can apply for our time right now. The second reading especially, I think, is something that gives us insight. So let's talk about that a little bit as well. In both the story of Genesis and in the Matthew account, we have God speaking through the narrative and telling us about some things about hospitality. So the first one, we see the physical hospitality, but we also, if we dig a little deeper, can see some things that are highlighted in both texts. We know that we are invited and called as Christians to do whatever we can to give people welcome, that our very lives are in essence like a guest house. And those who come to meet us, as, as the rule of St. Benedict says, we are to greet as if we are greeting Christ himself. But there's a little more to it. 
And in both of these texts, if you dig, you'll see it. I would like to suggest that not only are you and I called to give physical hospitality using whatever resources we have around us, but also to practice two other kinds of hospitality. One is hospitality to ourselves. We see Jesus looking out on the crowd and he sees them as if they are sheep without a shepherd. These are people who are sick, who are dealing with all sorts of chronic problems, poverty, oppression, living under an exploitative empire. And Jesus has sympathy for them. And he calls the disciples to care and to be leaders themselves in doing that kind of care. He gives them the power to offer change to the people around them. And the only way that could happen is if those disciples were hospitable within themselves so that they could grow and heal and become the kinds of leaders and people that their relationship to Jesus required. In other words, they couldn't do anything unless they were in that relationship with Jesus. So it was this relationship with Jesus that enabled the disciples to be hospitable even to themselves. They were allowing the teachings of Jesus and their confidence and faith in Jesus to change them within so that they could become people who did what Jesus did. In the same respect, when we look at Abraham and Sarah, there was a sense in which the hospitality to themselves was absolutely fundamental to the changes that came afterwards. For Abraham, he had some sort of relationship with God that had brought him to that place. The God of his understanding, who was disclosing that he was going to travel to a foreign land, that he was going to be the father of many nations, he already recognized, Abraham did, that that God was working in the world. And so when he saw those three visitors, somehow he knew, the text tells us, he had this instinctive sense of their importance and value. And so that caused him to run and offer that hospitality. Likewise, when you think about Sarah, well, Sarah had to really practice inner hospitality because she, in fact, was going to be hosting a child in her body. And by faith, that was going to happen. So she was going to have to make choices for her future that would enable her to let God do the work that would be happening in order for the promise to be fulfilled. So what does that kind of hospitality in ourselves look like? I would argue that when we're trying to be hospitable to ourselves, it means to do what St. Teresa of Avila suggested. She says that inside of ourselves, we need to have like a cell, a bedroom, a place within ourselves where we welcome God. It's a space where we look at ourselves and really know ourselves, and we do that in the light of who God is. That is how we practice hospitality to ourselves, to know ourselves. As Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So we examine ourselves and we live in that place where instead of beating ourselves up, we look with generosity and grace. And instead of thinking we're the greatest people in the world, we live in humility because we know that we are only whole and made well in the life of God. Sarah had that and Abraham had that, and the disciples had that. That sense that within themselves there was a hospitality that was honest about who they were and welcomed God within their lives. We do that as we live prayerfully, as we practice during this time of pandemic, hopefully having a little more time for self-reflection. As we participate in classes or read books that help us have greater insight about who God is and who we are. And then finally, we practice hospitality toward God. Abraham and Sarah had a hospitality towards God, an openness to God that allowed them to, to let an unfulfilled promise linger for decades and decades, believing that God was still present and able to do the thing that they hoped for. In the same respect, the disciples 
opened themselves to God and allowed God's power to go through them to the people around them. That's our invitation too, friends. It reminds me of a story. It was in um, To Kill a Mockingbird. The children in that book had found a hollow tree. And they went up to the tree and they found the hollow. And so they put little trinkets into that hollow of the tree, little things that they had, just to see what would happen. And lo and behold, one day they went by and their trinkets weren't there anymore, but there were other things in the tree, things they had not expected. And it created this tremendous mystery. What can we put in and what will we discover when we go by that we can take out? It was a little game that they soon discovered was with someone that was important to the book. But what about us? What are we putting into that hollow of God, into that cell within ourselves where God dwells, that we can find those treasures to give to others? When we do that, when we live with a generosity toward ourselves and others, we grow. We become whole people. So maybe this week that'll look for you like finding some time to be still and think about yourself, to practice this thing that we call SNAP in the Enneagram class that many of us were in, where we stop, we notice, we assess what's happening within ourselves, and we pivot so that whatever it is that we're doing that's not of God, we can find a way to turn towards what is of God. And what is of God is what is of us in our best self. So think about that for yourself. How will you practice hospitality for yourself? And then consider, how will you practice hospitality to God? What will it look like to welcome God, the God who has disappointed you as well as given you hope? How will you live into a deeper relationship with God? This is a beautiful time for us to be walking deeper in faith because of both the time that we have, that's hopefully for some of us a little extra time, and because as we're transitioning back to work, back to public life, there is in inherently hospitality that we need to give to the world and faith that we can trust God's promise for us. So may we do that. May we put our gifts out there in the world and remember that as we generously receive others, we also will generously receive. This week, may you experience the hospitality of God in your life. The God who runs after you and hugs you and welcomes you home regardless of everything that's happened. May you experience hospitality in the way that you interact with those around you. And may you give hospitality to yourself, giving yourself the opportunity to feel the power of God changing you and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen.